Good afternoon. I'm Mark Skirsky. Currently, I'm a postdoc at the Nikolaus Copernicus Astronomical Center, but in a week I changed my workplace to the University of Concepcion in Chile. And uh, I'm a member of the Araucaria Project. This is an international team focused on the calibration of the cosmic distance scale. And uh, thank you for inviting me to this conference. It's a great honor and uh, also a great honor to deliver a great talk on observational astronomy. And I hope you can hear me well. This is fine, yes? So in the uh, Araucaria uh, project, we work with the Cosmic Distance Ladder. The basic idea here is to calibrate uh, those uh, short range to, to use those short range geometric methods for the purpose of calibration of the secondary distance indicators, such as the classical synthates. And those brightest uh, secondary distance indicators, the standard candles, they might be used as calibrators of, of supernovae. And then uh, supernovae in uh, galaxies in the Hubble flow may uh, allow us to, to for, for calibration of uh, the Hubble constant H0. What is important here is that we use in parallel many different uh, distance determination methods of the same range, because physical foundations of, of those distance indicators, they differ. And uh, these methods are affected uh, by systematic biases that are, in, in principle, unknown for us uh, observational astronomers. So uh, the only way to, to actually account for them is to cross-check different distance determination methods of the same range. <coughs> and when it comes to the Hubble constant, uh, it's probably the most important uh, cosmological parameter. It's not only the rate of expansion of the universe, it's associated also with the age of the universe. We can uh, predict the fate of the universe based on that. And finally, um, we may determine distances to very, very distant galaxies knowing the day redshift. And currently, there are uh, two of the most precise ways to determine age not right now. One of them is based on the study of anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background radiation. So these are observations of the early universe at uh, the redshift of uh, about 1100. And uh, on the other side, uh, we may determine uh, the Hubble constant precisely based on the cosmic distance ladder, so this is uh, associated with observations of uh, the late universe, so the current, <coughs> the, 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 the current universe with redshifts of about uh, zero. When it comes to, uh, shortly to the determinations based on, on the cosmic microwave uh, uh, background radiation, uh, we observe uh, the uh, temperature fluctuations of, of uh, that radiation. Oh, I have some, okay, of that radiation. And we may obviously split, split that into the angular power spectrum and perform a six parameter fit. And uh, in one of these parameters, uh, this is the. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's a six parameter fit, and one of these parameters is the Hubble constant. However, this, this fit uh, it assumes the cosmological model because. Uh, uh, value of the Hubble parameter needs to be uh, propagated from, from the early universe to, to, to the current universe. So this is the model dependent determination. And uh, the uh, precision of uh, the precision of determinations of, of the Hubble constant was getting better and better over the years. And uh, at some point it became apparent uh, with, uh, with, Planck, with Planck observatory. Uh -huh. Maybe we have a regular mic or. Yes, I can give you that. Okay. Okay. 
leave me to do that turn now. And uh, so uh, Planck Space Observatory allowed for uh, the determination of the Hubble constant with uh, precision, sub percent uh, precision actually. But uh, on the other hand, uh, determination based on a, a supernovae calibrated with uh, classical C phase allowed also for, uh, for, for much better precision. And uh, at some point it became apparent that there is a discrepancy between the two approaches, namely, uh, this discrepancy is estimated right now at the level of 5 sigma by the uh, shoes team, so this is a team led by uh, Nobel Prize laureate Adam Rees, and uh, they claim uh, that there is this discrepancy of 5 sigma known as the Hubble tension. Uh, on the other hand, um, a competition of the shoes team, so Carnegie Chicago project that also works in the on the distance scale, they calibrated uh, supernovae using uh, the tip of the red giant branch method, and uh, they claim that uh, there is actually no Hubble tension, and uh, they, they receive results, the, the value of the uh, Hubble constant that is in between uh, the value based on C phase and, and the value from cosmic microwave background radiation. So here, from, from our perspective, as observational astronomers, it's important to check for uh, possible systematic um, errors in our methods. Uh, obviously, other reasons for that uh, apparent tension might be that errors are uh, underestimated here. Another reason might be that uh, our cosmological uh, model would need to be revised and altered. And here, uh, another um, plot depicting the Hubble tension. What is uh, worth to notice here that or all uh, the Hubble uh, constant determinations based on the uh, di direct Hubble constant determinations, so based on the cosmic distance ladder, yield larger value than, uh, than um, uh, determinations, the indirect determinations based on uh, the cosmic microwave background radiation uh, and the cosmological model. So before we continue, I, I, a quick reminder that in astronomy we use the magnitude scale, so basically this is the logarithmic scale of radio, radiative fluxes or intensities, and we have to remember that 100 of um, magnitude in error means that we have 1% error of the flux, relative error of the flux. And uh, in the distance scale we use uh, the notion of the distance modulus, so basically this is magnitude uh, normalized to 10 parsec. So it's a difference of uh, observed magnitude and uh, magnitude as if we observed it at, uh, from the distance of, uh, observed that object from the distance of 10 parsec. And in this, um, and in this case, 200 of the magnitude uh, of error of the distance modulus corresponds to the relative error of, of linear uh, distance of 1%. And also a reminder that uh, in astronomy, metals, these are all elements except hydrogen and helium. Uh, but in practice, we use uh, observational proxies, so a ratio of the number of uh, atoms of uh, iron to the number of atoms of hydrogen normalized to the uh, solar value. So this is what I mean by metallicity. So now I, I will start uh, the, um, climbing up the ladder. So the first rank, um, these are the first rank of, of the ladder. These are the geometric methods. So the, the, they are the most precise methods that we have. They are needed uh, to anchor uh, secondary distance indicators to calibrate their um, zero points, zero points of methods such as uh, classical. Uh, pure luminosity relations for classical C phase. So uh, I'll start with the parallax. We obviously know uh, what uh, the parallax is, and the idea is simple here. Here, but uh, from the technical point of view, it requires very precise astrometric measurements. So uh, it was not until 1830s that the first stellar par parallax was measured, 
And uh, great breakthroughs happened with the launch of, of uh, space observatories devoted specifically to, to measurements of stellar parallaxes. First, uh, it was the Hipparchos Space Observatory that observed more, more than 100,000 stars uh, in the Milky Way. And uh, also Hubble Space Telescope observed in little 12 stars. Here we were able to obtain uh, the precision of around uh, a uh, few uh, milli arc seconds. And uh, another great breakthrough that is happening still right now, this is the Gaia Space Observatory uh, that observes uh, more than 2 billion uh, stars in our galaxy and, and gives us um, uh, the, their parallaxes with uh, pre precision of even a few micro arc seconds. So there are consecutive data releases uh, of, uh, for, from Gaia. And, however, the, the, the calibration of, of, uh, of parallaxes is quite a complex issue and uh, obviously we need some kind of fixed uh, uh, reference frame, so this is based on, on, on distant quasars. And uh, parallax corrections, calibrations, they depend on, on, on offsets, uh, they depend on, on, on position, color, apparent magnitude of the star. So in particular, uh, at first, Gaia had problems with very bright objects, such as the classical CPEG. So obviously, we would like to use the brightest, the, we would like to calibrate the brightest distance indicators to reach as far as possible. But uh, well, Gaia had problems with that at first, but it seems consecutive uh, data releases uh, handle that better. Uh, another geometric method of, of uh, distance determinations is based on the notion of, of angular diameter. So, um, assuming we have a linear size of an object, we may uh, immediately obtain distance to it by measuring angular diameter. And actually, we may measure angular diameter directly using interferometers. However, these are, uh, from the technological point of view, these are very uh, demanding devices, so there are not so many of them. And uh, as we can see on this plot, uh, two telescopes are used at the same time, at least two. So, uh, and in, in, in astronomy, the observational time is, is uh, very valuable. So we, we cannot really determine angular diameters of all objects we would like. So we, have, we need to have some kind of calibration between photometry, because what the easiest thing we can do is, is just photometry, and angular diameters. Calibration based on, 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 on inter interferometry, obviously. And our, uh, well, here comes the notion of, of um, the surface brightness uh, that we need. So basically this is... Um, surface brightness uh, given in, uh, in the magnitude scale. Here we have area, so uh, this is actually the solid angle uh, spanned by, by our source on the celestial sphere, and we may write it in terms of the angular diameter. Uh, given no extinction, such quantity is independent, uh, independent of distance, and it might be shown that it depends on uh, effective temperature. And actually, effective temperature may be probed by, probed by measuring color. By color, I mean the difference um, between magnitudes uh, in two different filters, in two different bands. So this is color in, in astronomy. And finally, we, we may obtain the angular diameter knowing the surface brightness and having magnitude in a given band. So in this, the, in this case, I have the visual, so 500 nanometer, more or less, um, band. And uh, our team calibrated uh, a surface brightness color relation. So this is a uh, surface brightness and V minus K color, so the visual band, and K is 0.2 micrometer near infrared band. And uh, we calibrated it for uh, 41 uh, helium burning stars. And using such a relation, we are able to recreate um, angular direct diameters with, um, with, with precision better than 1%. So this, is, uh, this relation is crucial for our further determinations. And having this relation, 
uh, we, we are able to determine distances to so-called deep abstract using binaries. So these are systems of uh, that, these are double stars like, that were systems where we can see eclipsing um, uh, stars and uh, we we may measure radial velocities of both components by disentangling uh, their spectra when we have high resolution spectroscopy. We may do that. We have well covered uh, light curves in the optical domain, and having these, we are able to uh, we are able to, to model uh, the system and obtain parameters of orbits, masses, ratios, of luminosities, and what is the most important uh, radii of both components. And uh, from the near infrared photometry that we require for the surface band correlation. We are able to estimate angular diameters of, of uh, both components, and then by having radii and angular diameters, we obtain distance to such systems. And uh, we measured uh, distances to 20 uh, such systems in the large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, it allowed us uh, to obtain a distance uh, to this uh, nearest uh, galactic neighbor of, uh, of, of our Milky Way with a precision of uh, 1%. And currently, this is one of the main anchors in the uh, calibration of the distance scale in the determination also of the Hubble constant, uh, with other anchors being uh, the Gaia parallaxes and, uh, and water major galaxies. So this is the third. Um, this is the third uh, geometric method. The last geometric method that I described. Basically, this is a system that is quite rare. So we have only one such calibrator of classical C phase. So we have here uh, clouds of uh, water molecules uh, orbiting around uh, the. Uh, galactic center where there is a black hole with uh, accretion disk, and so this is uh, a source of, of, of heat of radiation that induces uh, maser emission from those water clouds. And uh, these are observed um, using uh, spectroscopy. With this, uh, the, there is this discrete peak 22 gigahertz. We may measure uh, radial velocities from it and. And using uh, interferometry again, uh, angular velocities of such clouds. So, so movement of this cloud, uh, the clouds may be traced. They also model uh, some some uh, um, you know, using Keplerian rotation curve. They model such a system, and it's possible to obtain distance uh, to that object. It's uh, important that this galaxy is almost edge on uh, towards uh, when we look at it. Can I interrupt you for a second? How far this uh, this uh, cloud extends from the central black hole? Uh -huh. uh, I can tell actually right now because I'm, I'm not doing that personally. It's uh, it's uh, we we. There is a unit. There is a Ah yes, there is. Oh, yes, there is. Actually, yes, there is half. Ah, so half the light. You want to? Yeah. So it's. At most, a few, few like just one and a half at most, right? Okay. And uh, okay, so we move on to to uh, the secondary distance indicators. So I divided them here um, into period luminosity relations for pulsating stars and color magnitude di color magnitude diagram based method. So the color magnitude diagram is uh, what you know as the hertzsprung russell diagram, but phenomenological. So I'll start with uh, pulsating stars. So we are the most interested in those stars sitting here in the main instability stream. And so their pulsations are associated with the layer of the partial second ionization of helium. It acts actually as a heat engine that uh, that that uh, makes uh, such a star pulsate, and uh, the the most known uh, pulsators uh, these are classical C phase, and already in 1912, Hendrik Van Levitt discovered a relation between periods and 
magnitudes for these stars and uh, it allowed uh, Hubble to determine distance to the Andromeda galaxy to reconcile the so-called great debate that was ongoing around 100 years ago so they were wondering whether Spira and Nebuli are members of, uh, of the Milky Way are within our own galaxy or they are separate galaxies so obviously the, the latter and they found out that the, the, the latter is true and also it allowed, the, the sea fates also allowed um, Hubble to and to make first measurements of, of uh, the Hubble constant. And uh, contemporarily we know that sea fates are young pulsating uh, stars and they trace the disk subsystem. They are often, fa often found uh, uh, in, in um, star forming regions, near, near the star forming regions in, in very dense um, and crowded environments, uh, dusty as well. So it makes, uh, it makes uh, determinations uh, um, of distances to them more problematic because of that. So uh, our team, uh, this is a long-term project actually, our, one of, of the long-term projects of our team, it was the determination of distances to nearby galaxies based on classical sea fates. And so first we had to identify classical sea fates using uh, optical photometry because the bluer the wavelength is, uh, the larger amplitude of pulsations is, so it's easier to, to find them. Uh, we need also near infrared photometry uh, because uh, we have lower extinction, interstellar extinction in near infrared, and we want to get rid of this of such biases as, as extinction. And uh, our distances are fixed, as I said, they are anchored, uh, zero points of uh, such relations are fixed to the large Magellanic cloud. And here we have distances to nine galaxies from the local group and uh, from the sculptor group uh, with a typical precision of around 3%. And this is the method that we use, this is called the multiband method. So basically, when we write uh, the, the distance modulus, actually it's at, uh, affected, it depends on the band, on the wavelength we, observe, we, we measure it in, uh, because we, we are affected by reddening, by the extinction. And we may write such uh, wavelength dependent distance modulus as uh, some true distance modulus, plus the uh, influence of the reddening that we split into uh, the so-called color excess, so this is how color uh, is uh, affected by the reddening, and the reddening curve. So this is tabulated, this value is tabulated, it may depend a little bit on environment, but in general this is fixed here, and, uh, and what we determine in such a fit, so we have visual, I band 900 uh, nanometer, J1.2 micrometer, K2.2 micrometer. But what we determine here, uh, the intercept is the true distance modulus to, uh, to this galaxy, and the slope of such relation is the mean reddening that uh, affects uh, sea waves. Besides that, uh, we also uh, trace the influence of blending and crowding. So blending basically is a bias associated with uh, the fact that our sea fates, they might uh, have some unresolved angular companions, so they don't need to be physical companions, but uh, we, have, um, we have some additional flux from a companion that is unresolved, and, uh, and, and, and it makes uh, our measurements of, of the flux uh, biased. So this is blending and crowding, uh, this is associated with some uh, background of, of very dense um, environment. So this might be red giants, for instance, in a very, very dense region of a, a galaxy that add to, uh, effectively add to noise uh, of our observations. So uh, using uh, the Hubble Space, Space Telescope, our team was able to estimate the influence of, 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 of such uh, effects at the 2% it biases distance to that specific galaxy at the level of 2%. However, these biases, these two biases, they depend uh, on distance and also on wavelength. 
and in which we observe. And these are, uh, well, they, this, this, they are very puzzling, as you will see. So, uh, now I, I will talk about problematic issues with CBAID-based distances. So, uh, we know now that uh, CBAIDs are surrounded by certain stellar envelopes, but actually we don't know very much about these envelopes, and they are observed mostly at shorter distances. So, uh, what's being assumed is that uh, CBAIDs that calibrate our relations, um, they, they are surrounded by pretty similar environment as, as, as CBAIDs that will determine distances to in, in supernova calibrating galaxies. And, uh, well, it, sh it should be investigated further, but as I said, we don't know much about these. We have also a member of our team that works specifically on that. Another, another uh, issue is metallicity effect. So different authors can don't agree on the level of the metallicity effect. Basically, the metallicity effect is some additional term here, gamma term. So how, uh, how the uh, magnitude of, uh, of a separate changes with its chemical composition, with its metallicity. And authors not only uh, do not agree on the quantity of that uh, effect, but also on the sign of that effect. However, uh, it's been shown that uh, because the, the calibrating sample of, of CFAIDs and the sample uh, that we measure distances to has similar distribution of metallicities, it shouldn't really affect no matter what, what this effect uh, report, if we choose any of those reported effect, metallicity effects, it shouldn't actually affect uh, the determination of the Hubble constant in any significant way. And uh, the crowding that I already talked about, uh, here we may see this other major galaxy again, and uh, well, uh, we may observe uh, some inner dense fields and CFAs there and outer fields. So this is also uh, from the work of, of the Schultz team. And construct period luminosity uh, relations for CFAs based on outer regions, inner regions. And uh, we may see that uh, the, the scatter uh, for, for the relation based on uh, the outer space is significantly lower than uh, for those uh, from the uh, crowded field. Uh, however, the zero points here, they, they are in pretty good agreement. And statistically, they, they are coherent. Uh, so, uh, the claim of the authors is that it only adds to the noise, not to the zero point uh, in, this, uh, in, in this specific case. However, as I said before, this effect it depends on the distance because we have fixed resolution of our instrument. And, um, and uh, it gets worse and worse at larger distances. And also, uh, the thing... Uh, that, that these authors uh, do, well, uh, they, they, they um, study the systematic effect of uh, crowding um, through injection of artificial stars in, in environments where their separates are, are being uh, observed. And uh, thus they are able to um, estimate a systematic correction for all their CBAIDs, observed CBAIDs. And in this work, this is older work from 2011, actually, but this is uh, the, the way how it's done. Um, and the median uh, correction um, of, of, uh, in terms of magnitude corresponded to uh, the Hubble constant bias of around 7 kilometers per second per megaparsec. But uh, from the statistical point of view, it seems um, correct, and this is how how they deal with um, with the crowding issue. And uh, finally, here we may see a comparison between images from the James Webb Space Telescope and from the Hubble Space Telescope at the bottom, HST uh, at the top, James Webb, and we we may see. These are the same fields, so we may see significant 
um, significant uh, increase in the resolution and that allows to, to, to actually resolve those sea phase. So uh, there are really high hopes about the James Webb Space Telescope, specifically when it comes to this blending and, and, and crowding issues. But uh, there are no results yet based on the James Webb. Another uh, important method uh, of, of uh, distance determination in this second rank of the ladder, this is the tip of the red giant branch, so basically a red uh, giant branch star evolves, uh, a red giant star evolves around, uh, along this branch by burning uh, hydrogen in a uh, shell above, uh, um, above uh, a degenerate helium core and at some point the temperature of the core becomes high enough that uh, an explosive emission of free alpha reactions occurs and uh, the degeneracy is lifted, uh, the core expands and uh, the, the, the shell shrinks, the star moves away from the branch then and uh, we see it uh, on such color magnitude diagram as a discontinuity in density of, of those red giant branch stars uh, here. And uh, well, well, when we plot a luminosity function, we, we can see a sudden drop uh, in the number of stars over, over, over red giants. And uh, such a drop, uh, the magnitude of that drop actually is a standard angle and uh, it may be um, estimated using edge detection techniques such as the solar filter. And uh, these stars, uh, well, and, uh, this is observed in uh, the I band, so 900 nanometer. Uh, these stars, they are uh, they trace the old stellar population, so they are observed in halos of galaxies, so in much sparse regions than sea phase. They are less affected by dust, the extinction, and uh, issues such as blending uh, or crowding are, are not, um, not so problem, they are not, not a problem for them. However, this method actually depends on the metallicity. So in this plot on the left, we may see, uh, so the blue uh, and green, these are two different globular clusters. For the, the green 47 Tucane is more metallic. And so we may see that the slope of that uh, red giant branch uh, differs very much from, from, the, from the slope of, of, of uh, the blue uh, globular cluster on the Centauri. And also the value of, of the tip uh, depends on, on metallicity. And so when we look at, uh, at those red dots, this is a galaxy observed with the Hubble Space Telescope that has many different populations in it. So there are uh, red giant branch stars of different metallicities. And the situation here is very blurred um, because uh, uh, we have also a degeneracy between the influence of, of metallicity and uh, of uh, the influence of the in intrinsic reddening within that galaxy. So different regions of that galaxy are affected by reddening in a different manner, but they have also different metallicity. Uh, so it's really hard to distinguish those two effects in that case, to determine um, the other time branch for those red uh, spots. So these are, these are problems. Uh, with, uh, with the method. Additionally, we would like to, uh, uh, to use this method in near infrared because these stars are brighter in, in, uh, for, for longer wavelength lengths. And also, uh, we would like to get rid of, of, of the red end if possible. However, uh, this edge here uh, is no longer, no longer perpendicular to the magnitude axis uh, for near infrared bands. And uh, we could apply some, we, we could rotate this diagram somehow, but again, the slope of that depends also on the reddening. So, uh, again, we have a degeneracy. Uh, so, uh, these are the problems that, that um, 
uh, of, of that particular method. And the, the third uh, method, uh, that, uh, that secondary distance indicators, um, that is the, the, the most recent, I would say. Uh, these are the carbon stars. Uh, carbon stars, they are <coughs> sort of the giant brown stars. They are very red, so they might be see very much to, to the right on the Hertzsprung Russell diagram. And their effective temperatures are quite low, so they are easily distinguished by uh, their colors. And uh, they, they have very well confined luminosities. This is because they have well, uh, they have uh, their, their masses from relatively narrow interval. Uh, because uh, these stars, uh, when they are too, uh, too massive, they, they experience so-called hot bottom burning. So coal is being burned, uh, carbon and carbon is being burned, burned then. And uh, it, it will never reach the stellar surface. On the other hand, when they are not massive enough, uh, their convective envelopes do not reach uh, deep enough to bring uh, carbon uh, to the surface. So this is the basic, uh, the basic uh, reason why they are good candidates for standard candles. And in practice, uh, they are obs observed um, in the J 1.2 micrometer band. And uh, we calibrated this method, uh, we may see uh, the luminosity function of these stars. Uh, so uh, this luminosity function um, allows us to, uh, we, 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 we model this function in order to get the mean magnitude uh, of, of these stars. So this is a statistical method. And we model also some contamination by the giant young stars and background galaxies, and these stars are very bright, uh, they, are, they are more luminous uh, than um, the tip of their giant branch, and they are as, as bright as a 20-day C-fade, uh, as a C-fade with a position period of, of 20 days. So they are considered as an uh, alternative way, actually, uh, to calibrate the supernova. And we are, we are able to determine distances to nine galaxies using this, this uh, method of, of carbon stars, using carbon stars, and we have a very good agreement actually with classical C fades. So these are carbon star distances, these are C fade distances. So the mean difference that we got is 100 of a magnitude with the spread of 600 of a magnitude. However, this, uh, this method and needs further development. Uh, this is the, the, the least explored method of the, the, the three secondary distance indicators that I, I described. For instance, we don't know the metallicity effect. We, as you can see, we have an outlier here. We don't really know why we have such a huge uh, discrepancy between the CFA distance and the, the carbon star distance. Uh, but but this is a promising method, I would say. So, uh, finally, um, uh, the, the last step, this is the calibration of type 1A supernovae. We don't do that yet, at least. And uh, it's, it's being done by the Schutz team and also the current Chicago team. So, uh, type 1A supernova is a standard disabled candle, so it requires some phenomenological model. And uh, as I said before, this is a three-step calibration. Mm, in the case of the Schuss team, they have uh, 42 calibrating supernovae in 37 host galaxies when, uh, where they observe C plates. And in the Hubble flow, they observe 300 supernovae at, uh, at small redshifts, and they perform a global field of lateral <coughs> in a moment, and uh, well, some of the potential pro problems with supernovae uh, is that we know they might have uh, type 1a supernovae, they might have different progenitors, so we know that uh, there is this single degenerate, double degenerate scenario, they, they may be of different, uh, um, different uh, light curves, 
and also the extinction law, again extinction, uh, so the dependence uh, of extinction on the wavelength. It is assumed that this, this is some, some uniform canonical extinction law, but we really don't know what's going on in those uh, supernova host galaxies in the Hubble so. So these are some patterns of, 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 of that. And this is the, the global feed of, of the ladder. So actually, uh, the Schuster, they perform at one speed of all parameters, both um, pure luminosity relations for classical space and, and, and the Hubble's, and they have a very large uh, covariance matrix that, that they provide in their work. So I think this is the summary of my talk. Uh, obviously, cosmic distances are not only for the purpose of the Hubble constant determination, because they are fundamental uh, in astronomy, also because we need them to calibrate energetics of any astrophysical phenomena. It is very important to cross-check different methods to look for uh, systematic, potential systematic errors. Um, as you can see, uh, there might be some, some, some arguments um, between uh, different teams or different, uh, different determinations. And, uh, well, we need a three-step approach uh, in this topic. But this is too direct because it's model independent uh, determination, actually. Cosmological model independent determination. All right, and uh, if I have maybe two minutes, so of course. Okay. Um, so this is the, the propaganda part. <laughs> so I would like just, just to highlight a new Polish observatory in the Chilean Atacama Desert. Uh, so, um, Chilean Atacama is one of the probably best spot for the observational astronomy uh, because this is the driest desert on the Earth. Low, low water vapor levels, um, they allow us to specifically for, for very precise near infrared uh, observations. And here we see our observatory as it looks now. Um, it is located near and near the construction site of the European uh, Extremely Large Telescope, which will be the largest telescope on Earth. And so this is uh, our hill. Uh, so right now we have uh, five telescopes here, but uh, with a prospect to build uh, the largest one, 2.5 meter uh, optical telescope. And these are our telescopes there, so this is 0.6 optical. 0.8 uh, optical telescope with their sets of, of so they are used for uh, photometry and we have also a uh, near infrared telescope and uh, the largest one of them, 1.5 uh, optical, this is the largest Polish uh, telescope up to date actually and uh, we will also have a uh, high resolution spectrograph connected so, uh, this is the first slide from our optical 0.8 meter telescope. Soon we will have uh, an official opening of the observatory, but we already uh, conduct observations mostly uh, of, of uh, distance indicators within the Milky Way, but we will also observe uh, distant quasars, active galactic nuclei. Uh, we would like also to, to determine distances to these. Uh, so, okay, this is all. I invite you to visit our uh, web page. And thank you. Uh, right now, this, I, I tell you, this is around 
to work with 12. Well, no, no, no. sorry, before, with 12 uh, mega light years, so around four and a half. Four and a half megabytes. Something like this. Yeah. Um, oh, okay, thank you. So, I, I guess. This uh, carbon center also be used for the calibration of uh, supernova. And Not yet, but they will. They are already observed mm -hmm. um, with using the James Webb Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. So they will be definitely used. Uh, this is already uh, we we already anticipate uh, these these calibration. So, so are you determining right now this outlier if it's taken for granted? In which direction it will change? It's not if it's useful. Like, no, this this is rather um, the uh, this is not in the Hubble flow. So yeah, this is not, yeah. This if it's used for calibration for the supernova. Yes, this this is rather well. When it comes to determinations uh, of these distances to nearby galaxies, this is something very different than than determinations to very far galaxies. Because usually we have good agreement in. The low, very local uh, neighborhood because we have good resolution we can resolve those stars mm -hmm. uh, what's, what becomes a problem this is that we have uh, disagreement for very uh, distant that's the most crucial part for the for I, the, I think, the, 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 the yeah obviously we are we are checking also for potential uh, systematics uh, nearby but right now uh, discrepancy also between the tip of the red giant branch and classical C fades. It's not observed nearby. There is good agreement between the two methods yeah, for nearby. Way. But when we reach far away, it becomes... So this outlier is more consistent with the TRGP, uh, uh, I would say, uh, okay, this is... <laughs> for, for this range, these three methods are accurate. For this range. This is not very distant part of the universe, I would say, for Omega Parse. I think this outlier is associated with um, crowding, probably. Because there's like kind of six sigmas in there, six, seven sigma. Yes, yes. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So th this is this is some 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 systematic bias associated with with crowding again, probably. So uh, we could, uh, in principle, we could observe these stars in more sparse regions, because, okay, uh, CPAIDs, they are young stars in, uh, in disks. So we know they are affected by the dust, by the crumping. Uh, tip of the return branch, they are uh, old stars in the halo system, so better. And uh, these carbon stars, they are in intermediate population, so they are in the thick disk. So these regions are not so crowded, but they, they still are affected by that. Obviously, you may reach to the outer regions of a galaxy, but then our statistics gets worse. We have uh, fewer number, smaller number of these stars. So some authors, they, they reach to the outer regions, but okay, they have a few stars, and they, they, ask, they uh, pretend they have good statistics for, for, from 14 stars. And here we may see, uh, I have the, the calibrating sample size in the large Magellanic like cloud, 9,000 stars. And when we have here, for instance, 20 stars, mm -hmm. because this is what actually some authors do with their Hubble Space Telescope data, I don't know, 15 stars, and, and some of them are not even stars, but background galaxies, because the background galaxies are actually observed um, at the same, on, uh, in the same color as well, for the same uh, interval of color. So then it becomes a bit shady. So we have somehow get rid, uh, get out from those dense regions, but also have good status. Those for the two supernovae at the Russian, they lie at a distance, I think, about 40 megabytes. Up to, I would say. Up to. Now, how people view the fact that the supernovae they are in one pair of galaxies and the average velocity of objects instead of stars inside of galaxies is of the order of hundreds of kilometers per second. 
which is about 5 to 10 percent of the Hubble flow at that distance. So, so how people deal with that? But uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, how, how it and influences the flux? There are proper motions. Okay, you see a supernova. You don't know whether it rotates in the direction to us or in the direction outward inside of its own galaxy to, to which it is confined. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so how do people take that into account? Do they have ways to determine the position of of the supernova to account for the proper motion? Mm -hmm. uh, I, can, I can't really uh, answer that question. Uh, whether there is... Uh, okay, we can see here... Um, yes, I know what you mean, but okay, in, in 42 is a large... Uh, in a way, it's a large statistic, so... Yeah, it should... But, but they are inside of a sphere of 40 megaparsecs. The of the motions is about 10% of the Hubble Yes, but uh, okay, 40 megaparsecs, I would say using Hubble Space Telescope, this is more like 20 megaparsecs, and most of them are. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I would have to actually do, to, to calculate with the uh, effect. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I, can, I, I don't have an answer for that right now. I have a completely naive question. Mm -hmm. uh, distance is uh, related to matrix. And distance is related to... Mm, to notion of matrix. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. From and uh, then what matrix do you use? It's flat completely? Yes, this is flat because this is the very nearby uh, universe, especially in the case of, of what we do. So those two first uh, steps of the ladder. So these are distances at, at most 20, 20 mega, uh, 20 mega light years. So we can assume uh, flat universe there. And, and no, we have nothing to do. No, 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 no. But actually, this is good, very good. This is this is very good assumption actually in in, in this case. It would be over, over exaggeration, I would say, to 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 assume something else at such short distances. However, uh, they do they do some corrections for for peculiar uh, velocities in this analysis mm -hmm. um, of of galaxies that are much farther. Yes, but in in, in our determinations, we do not. We use the flat, yes, in the flat universe. So our team works mostly on the first two um, ranks, steps of, of that distance scale. We would like to, to get into the calibration of the Hubble constant, but, but uh, we don't do that yet. We need a cosmotist. Thank you.